Political comedy cockfight. Talking heads head to head. For week ended June 8th, 2024. The criteria on which we judge our comedians. Number one, philosophy of humor style based on the output of the jokes. We'll try to get into the comedian's head to think about how they see humor. What's the philosophy of humor that they subscribe to? Number two, fallacies. The most popular incongruity theory of comedy basically says that a joke is a logical construction that has basically been broken. There is incongruity that has been introduced. Fallacies are representing deviations or wrong thinking related to formal logic. Therefore, we're going to look at some of the jokes and see if we can fit them into a fallacy construction that has been exaggerated for comedic effect rhetorical techniques which include things like rhyme rhythm assonance alliteration and many many more flowers of language how much of this is being added to the presentation or formation of the joke and what's the impact of the rhetorical techniques on us the listener remembering that some rhetorical techniques can often be or actually be the baseline on which jokes are constructed, such as, for example, bumper stickers, which usually have a parallel construction that's the first foundation on which the joke is then built. Modern tools like AI to improve it. Most of these comedians come from a world of stand-up comedy, moving to online and social media formats as now, and therefore are probably not as quick to adjust to the dancing, the changing landscape with things like AI images, like chat GTP, giving individuals like us possibly an in, a way to basically get into the market. So for example, these large institutions, they have name recognition, they have advertising, and I do not think that the social media platforms are a even playing field in any way, shape, or form. However, these large institutions are also big bureaucracies with their own politics that they have to deal with and so on and so forth. And they can't easily change as this rapidly changing landscape changes and therefore taking advantage of new angles, new technology such as AI art, video, movie clips and whatnot is an advantage the individual has because they don't have to talk to the committee. to do what they want to do. I am not a committee. Presentation style and body language. In other words, how much of the joke is dependent simply on the structure of the wording of the joke and how much of the joke is dependent on the presentation, the body language, even the tonality of the person presenting the joke. Is the joke a uh, situation used to make a joke or is the joke designed to make a political point or both? This is going to be more of a spectrum because we're looking at people that are both comedians, but they also are trying to make a political point. So the question is, are they on more of the side of taking the current situation to make people laugh? Or are they more on the side of using their comedic talent and tools to push their political viewpoint? Resources. We might provide a PDF or possibly an online OneNote resource with definitions. However, if you want more information about the flowers of rhetoric, rhetorical tools, I highly recommend, although am not affiliated with in any way, The Elements of Eloquence, Secrets of the Perfect Turn of Phrase by Mark Forsyth, found in audiobook format on Audible as well as Kindle format. I like the audiobook because it's quite funny in a dry British humor style. And although quite funny, it's the best book I've seen on this topic, even though I've looked for other books on this topic. Also, I highly recommend The Great Courses, although I'm not affiliated with them at all. They now have a streaming platform with many of their courses on it. Personally, I have now canceled Disney. I've canceled Netflix. I have the streaming of the great courses as well as some crunchy roll for my anime. This course, An Introduction to Formal Logic, gets into what formal logic is and the fallacies, remembering that that kind of lines up with joke structure. Joke structure, according to the incongruity theory of comedy, being a system or f argument that has been broken. There's incongruity. 
Another course is Take My Course, Please, The Philosophy of Humor. This isn't really a course for comedians to make stand-up comedy, but it gets into the theory of what comedy is. Both these courses by Stephen Gimbel, who has done comedic work himself, but is more of a professional philosopher and teacher. Also, uh, some of this information comes from Greg Dean, Step by Step to Stand Up Comedy, which is the most straightforward, this is how to construct a joke book that you can find. So if you have any interest in constructing jokes, I would think this is the place to start. We have Gutfield versus John Stewart covering the story of the Donald Trump conviction trial, the biggest story of the week. Both of these can be found on the YouTubes as well as elsewhere. For Gutfield, the full name is Gutfield. The saga of Donald Trump continues. And for John Stewart, the full name is John Stewart tackles the Trump conviction fallout and puts the media on trial. We have our notes over here, which we might provide in PDF format. So you can link directly to these resources if you so choose, as well as just take a look at the notes. So as we go through this particular topic they covered, we're going to try to see if we can identify the jokes and then analyze the components of those jokes and what the impact of those components are on us, the viewer. Yeah, of Donald J. Trump continues. Really, what did we talk about before him? <laughs> Aside from me, of course. It's a shame we only have an hour. But have you noticed the reaction to the Trump conviction? It's more muted than my TV during Jesse's show. <laughs> okay, so that's the first one that we can see is like a legitimate joke there. Not just knowing that because of the laugh, but we can see the structure within it as a joke construction, which we can always analyze with uh, the incongruity theory. So if we think about this in terms of what premise has been set up that has been broken, and the premise that we can say what was set up, uh, he likes his colleagues' show and there's nothing similar to the Trump conviction and watching Jesse's show. He kind of broke those assumptions that we would have when he says he mutes the channel, which would indicate that he doesn't like watching his colleagues' show and uh, this is similar to the, to the Trump court case. So he's drawing a parallel that we might ha not have drawn ourselves. Now, if we analyze that from the standpoint of a fallacy, we might call that a false equivalence where we have uh, muted the reaction to the Trump conviction is like me muting Jesse's show. We have two things that might not be comparable that we're comparing together. So it's the same kind of explanation, but I'm just trying to look at it from a different angle in terms of the terminology of a fallacy, which we have definitions for here on our uh, OneNote resource. We might provide a PDF for it as well. So you can look at these definitions and see how that might fit in there, what we're basically referring to. In terms of rhetorical techniques that he used, you'll notice that he asked the question, have you noticed the reaction to the Trump conviction? So there's multiple ways he could have introduced or going into that topic, but a rhetorical question is one that you don't typically expect an answer to have. So that's gonna be a type of rhetorical technique basically that he used to, to format his joke. And the question then would be, what kind was that an effective rhetorical technique? Is that the best way to, to enter into that particular joke or what's the impact of that introductory style? <laughs> Of course, there are the usual nutcases where anything related to Trump is cause for incontinence. Notice right there, he used a rhetorical scheme. It's not a joke, but he used caused for incontinence. So if I look at our, our rhetorical structure, then we have what we can call the uh, alliteration, right? Cause for incontinence. It's not really exactly started with the same letter, but you can see that double C kind of sound. It's going to give us, it's going to prick our ear a little bit and might have been a better choice of words than possibly others because of that. I also have this transferred epitaph or maybe a, a personification in that when we looked at uh, the muted TV, where muted is like what a person does when he's not talking. So we're kind of, act, although muted, is a term that we use for a TV. He's basically using that as though the TV is kind of acting like a person. You can kind of think of it as he's personifying kind of like the TV, or maybe the TV is being personified, muted like a human, right? So that might be a stretch in terms of 
of analyzing that particular joke with a rhetorical technique, but I'm just trying to apply some of these rhetorical concepts, which again, you could find a list of those over here and explore them with regards to the joke construction. At Costco buying, you know, 10 boxes of Keurig coffee, uh, and uh, my, my, my watch started to buzz, and I got so excited, I started leaking a little bit. <laughs> So, so Joy Behar wets herself in Costco. And for the first time, it wasn't over the free samples of chocolate-covered lard nuggets. <laughs> but aside from Joy and some has-been actors, where's all the noise? No one's dancing in the streets, weeping or peeing with Joy. So that then, we have a construction where basically he's using Joy in two different ways there. So the assumption then from an incongruity theory would be that joy means happiness because he's saying no one's weeping with joy. But the alternative story, the alternative construction is joy is the name of an actual person. So it's not going to get a big laugh, but you could see the incongruity there. Now, when we look at the fallacies, we're going to see the fallacy that comes up all the times in jokes, which of course is an ad hominem basically attack where he's basically saying the people that disagree are kind of nutcases because he said she's a, she's a crazy person, basically. And I don't think he said it in a really as derogatively as some comedians would, more in kind of like a playful way. But obviously ad hominem is going to be, and that ties in, ad hominem ties into a specific kind of theory of humor, which isn't just incongruity, but the idea that basically you have an in-group and you're putting yourself, you and your audience above uh, another group and that kind of uh, that kind of setup or dynamic can be funny. The other dynamic being you're putting yourself yourself you're putting yourself down in some way, uh, and sometimes that's funny. British humor often the person that's the comedian puts themselves down, uh, and and that's kind of a funny thing. Whereas American humor oftentimes seems like uh, they put themselves up uh, as compared to the to the other uh, group, and then there's some comedians that basically rely on kind of incongruity in a more playful style uh, rather than than that kind of just position. And then I also put here hasty generalization. And the idea would be here that he, he's saying he's coming up with a cause for something. Now, this is another common joke construction. You say this happened and this is why it happened. Now, now usually you're going to say, well, that's because in some experience in the past, this is what I've experienced. And so and so therefore, I'm going to basically generalize that to the current experience. Now, obviously, with joke construction, you're going to think of something that hasn't really happened. It's it's a it's going to be an a, a an exaggeration, which is which is another kind of fallacy kind of thing. Right. But the general idea is, well, I've seen this happen in the past and I'm going to apply that to this particular area, even though it obviously doesn't apply. And then with the rhetorical techniques, uh, we had some alliteration for the first time. Now, that's a stock phrase, but there's a reason it's a stock phrase. If you look at all the stock phrases, it's because there's some kind of rhetorical technique that's in it. There's a rhyme, there's an assonance, there's an alliteration. So that's just, you probably didn't think about that in the joke construction, but those little beats that you put into your phrases, if you do think about them, you can kind of manipulate or think about how you can construct things a little bit more detailed because you're using these little, these little uh, rhetorical techniques with these little stock phrases. Rhyme, aside from joy, where's all the noise? So there's kind of a rhyme that's going there. It's not a perfect rhyme, which again, he may or may not have like thought of when he put that out there. Uh, a rhetorical question, where's all the joy? So once again, he's asking a question which he doesn't really expect to hear an answer to. He's saying, where's all the joy rhetorically? resulted in a bump in Trump's polling and a massive $200 million bump in donations. 200. I know. 200 million. That's more than I make in a year. <laughs> All right. So, so what's going to be the assumption that was broken there? 200 million is a lot of money. The alternative story being I make close to that in a year. Right. But not really. Right. So he doesn't. So that's I don't think you're supposed to take that seriously, but that's going to be the just position, the assumption and then the alternative story.
From a fallacy's perspective, we might see that as basically arguing by analogy. We're going to say this is like that. So we're saying that the 200 million is like, you know, what I make it in a year. Now, that's kind of a stretch from kind of a fallacies argument. But if we're trying to use the same kind of terminology, that might be one way we fit it into the fallacies category. Continuing on. <laughs> it even crashed Trump's donation site, something I haven't seen since I started that GoFundMe page to ban Brian Kilmeade from public parks. <laughs> OK, so that so now we have the what's the what's the assumption that was broken here? Uh, let's go back up top here. The assumption that was broken. Uh, Brian is a is a good guy, which is why he's on my show. Sitting next to me would be kind of the assumption if he's sitting there. The alternative story, I crashed the GoFundMe page giving donations to keep him out of parks, right? So obviously there's going to be a broken assumption. You also have kind of a false comparison, like these two things are the same when they're, you would think that they were not the same, which you could see from an incongruity standpoint. From a fallacy standpoint, you might call that a false equivalence. So, so GoFundMe page for Trump is similar to the GoFundMe page for, for Brian. These are two similar situations, which have obviously don't seem similar because they've been put side by side, basically for comedic effect. In terms of uh, the rhetorical techniques, we had some alliteration where he said, I'm in it f uh, for whatever. F I'm, I'm in for it when he was in trouble from his wife. I'm in for it. So again, we start with a lot of eyes. Might not have been thinking about that, but his, his mind is probably thinking in certain rhythms and he uses some alliteration pros most likely just as a pattern of, of his speech. Rhyme, there was a bump in Trump, right? Again, he might not have thought of that consciously or he might have because that seems like somewhat deliberate of a rhyme. Alliteration starting with the same word, more than I make in a year. Again, he probably didn't, think about that consciously with the two M's, but you can see a little bit of uh, alliteration with that one. Let's continue on. Buy a dog if you want to hang out there. Within 24 hours, Trump's new TikTok account gained over 2 million followers, crushing the Biden-Harris account that had a five-month head start. And to be fair, it is a low bar. Hell, even Hillary's left testicle has more followers <laughs> than Biden-Harris. Okay, so... So what's the assumption that was broken there? Well, obviously we would assume Hillary's a woman. Women don't have testicles. Even if she did, her testicles would not get followers, right? These are all assumptions. So this seems like a fairly basic, like a, a joke that's just like an ad hominem joke, but it actually kind of set up multiple premises, which were basically broken with the punchline. So it's, it's, I, I find it like it might be more effective than I actually first thought. All the assumptions are, are, are broken. All these assumptions that she's, that she's, well, possibly that she's a woman that she has to, so, so I thought that was actually a more effective joke than, you, than we might have first uh, thought. Uh, in terms of the, the fallacies, we might say that that was, well, I didn't put a fallacy there. Uh, on the alliteration side of things, though, we said there was some alliteration when we say public parks. And again, I'm not thinking that he probably thought public parts. This is going back to when the, the guy was allowed in public parks or kicked out of public parks. That's I just want to point that as a, another kind of alliteration that we see all the time. It's a daily kind of phenomenon. That's why public parts was probably coined as a phrase because it has the alliteration, right? So then let's keep going. But vapid morons on TikTok are a voting block Biden can't afford to lose. What's next? Bar Biden starts to lose ground among dementia patients. So again, what's the assumption that's broken there from, from an incongruity? The president does not have dementia. And if he did, he should pull votes from that voting block. That would be the assumption. He's The president's the president. He can't be cognitively having problems. And if he did have problems, you would think that would at least help him out with those people in that that are having the same problem alternative story he does have dementia and still can't pull those votes now again you can't really tell these stories obviously he has to imply that to be funny it wouldn't be funny it's like no he does you know you it, the, the story has to basically you know tell the incongruity in a story format and then i put down here that we have a, a appeal to common opinion which is a type of fallacy where we basically say well, everybody knows uh, that that this is that this is the case. 
And so anytime you have a stereotype, that's sometimes going to be, you can think of that from a fallacy perspective as an appeal to common opinion. Everybody knows this. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's not true, but you can't rely on that alone as to what is true because of, you know, the, the mob isn't always right. False e equivalence and ad hominem. Biden is like a dementia patient. So now he's comparing, you know, Biden and dementia payments, patients, which you might say is a false equivalent. And obviously it's kind of a, a personal attack on Biden, which you could say ad hominem. With the rhetorical techniques, going back to that Hillary bit, we had, our, we could call it a transferred epitaph, possibly a kind of stretching or a signicticky, if I'm saying that right. Hillary described by a body part. So when you, when you describe people by their body parts, sometimes that's going to be a style of kind of stretching that because usually, usually you're describing people like uh, as, as though they are a body part, right? You can take a look at the definitions down here. Or the body part has human characteristics of getting votes. So in other words, you can use a rhetorical device as saying something that is not human has human characteristics, which is kind of going on when you're talking about, you know, the testicle is going to get votes, right? The te te testicles are part of the human, but they're not the human. And you wouldn't think that they would get the human characteristics of acquiring votes. Now, we also had this rhyme of uh, morons on TikTok. Note, TikTok was coined as a phrase, most likely because it has alliteration, uh, are a voting block. So TikTok Biden needs the TikTok voting block. That seems pretty intentional. I bet he probably made that rhyme intentionally. Fact is, Americans can tell the difference between Trump and Biden. One's facing a sentence, the other can't complete one. <laughs> so now if we look at that from in terms of incongruity, what's the assumption? All politicians are basically the same with some standard level of competence might be one assumption we have. And then he broke that assumption by basically saying Biden is, is not cognitively fit, right? He can't, so, so that's gonna be an assumption that has been broken with that. Let's do this and... Now we also used a term that has two meanings and that's often a, a pivotal point on jokes that you can create because that's gonna be a point at which you can misdirect. From a fallacy standpoint, you can call that uh, an, an equivocation, equivocation because the sentence has jail sentence, uh, but also means making a sentence. So he used that same word in two different ways, which gives you the incongruity and misdirection. Continuing. So, thank you, thank you. So how does Trump do it? How does he turn a conviction into an electoral windfall? How does he turn his adversary's energy into power? I call it the eternal cliffhanger theory. When Trump, with Trump, when one act finishes, it sparks an equally thrilling next one. He's like the orange Harry Potter. <laughs> and what creates the cliffhangers are those- So I'll stop it there, but notice he's got a comparison there. What's the assumption that's been made? Trump and Harry Potter are not similar, which is what you would assume. But he's saying, no, with this comparison, look how they're similar. Alternative story, Trump and Harry Potter are the same in this particular way, right? And so that's going to be the incongruity related uh, to those two stories. When we look at it in terms of uh, fallacies, false equiv uh, equivalence, Trump's story is like the Harry Potter story which again, whenever you're comparing two like things, you can think of it from a fallacy perspective as you're probably comparing two things that aren't exactly the same and you're making an exaggerated comparison for basically comedic effect. So if we go back through this now, note just in terms of the, the style that I think he uses, obviously incongruity style is gonna be what everybody uses because you can define jokes by incongruity. But I would also think that he seems to have a presentation style that adheres more to like a play theory style, meaning he seems to kind of present as though he's not really talking down to other people so much, although he does, you could see the ad hominem in there. That's going to be common for basically every uh, comedian. But it seems the way he does the presentation is more like he's talking to someone at a par level with him and he's making jokes like you would kind of uh, with a friend on a playground or something like that, almost like a child, like an adult child making jokes 
rather than trying to position the other above or below in in a way that's like really in a derogatory nature. Now that could be me because I happen to agree with his points more. <laughs> so 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 you can so that that might have an influence on him, the mix of and so with regards to the the tools that he is using, notice he's using some video clips which are great, but they seem pretty standard kind of video clips and they're just newsreels that everybody has access to. He's not like editing them in any way to, for the most part and he's and, and he's not using AI art and I'm I'm betting that his jokes are being constructed by a joke team that's putting them together. I would think that his network is less restrictive in his political ideas than other networks, but I would still think that he has to have a committee that he has to deal with and all that kind of stuff. So I th I think there's a lot of improvement that could be made and be done by just one individual with the use of possibly more images and more video, possibly movie clips and stuff like that, uh, which I might talk about uh, more later. Presentation style, joke structure is generally relatively tight. So in other words, I think he's he has a style that's pretty more like punchline and then the joke, kind of like maybe like a Rodney Dangerfield style where you could see punch, joke rather than putting a lot of emphasis on his presentation style his presentation style seeming to me kind of like he's telling a funny joke to like a friend that would be on like a like a adult playground kind of thing so it seems like more of a, a playful kind of delivery style as opposed to kind of putting himself down or putting the other putting someone else particularly down although again he does both of those to some degree at, as as well but and then uh, is the political situation used to make joke or is the joke designed to make the political point so in in his case i would think it's maybe i would say like 50 50 right i don't feel like i watched that and i and it was just for laughs as though he didn't have any political points clearly i can see that he that he has some political feelings about it but on the other hand i didn't feel like i watched that and it was he was using his talents with joke writing and rhetoric to simply come to simply argue uh, a particular political point persuade me right i didn't feel like manipulated really uh in it although maybe that's because he's really good at it i don't know you can make the argument also i basically tend to agree with with them more so i felt it was maybe like 50 50. now again with a political viewpoint so you would expect there, him to be somewhere you know, on, on giving a political point as well as making jokes. And it's just a question of how far is he on either side and whether or not it comes across to the recipient, the person watching as like, I'm being manipulated or is it just for laughs or what's kind of like the vibe, what's the feel that we're, that we're getting, we're getting from it to me. Again, I kind of agree with him more, so it seemed like kind of even 50-50. Next, we take a look at John Stewart with basically the same Trump trial topic. Remembering that you could find these on the YouTubes, the full title here being John Stewart tackles the Trump conviction fallout and puts the media on trial at The Daily Show. We might provide you a PDF which has a link to it as well as our notes. To former President Trump's trial convictions, for the left, the conviction was an exercise in concealed and controlled glee. Many now, we could think of that as the first joke, but you might not have picked that up or as easily recognized it as a joke, in part because I believe that's part of the philosophy of humor or the style of Jon Stewart. So in other words, we can analyze any joke, including this one, with the incongruity theory. However, we also thought about the idea that, for example, British humor Often the joke teller puts themselves down as kind of like the butt of the joke oftentimes. And many people in American comedy, they bring themselves up and they put the other person down. And I think Jon Stewart falls into that latter category clearly. So the idea being that if you and I were on the same page, we're on the same team, the other person is in the out group. They're going to be the butt of the joke, clearly, which leads to a more subtle style of humor. The insinuation being if you're a smart person, if you're in the know, you'll get the joke. If you're not in the know, then you just don't get it, man. You're outside and you will not get the joke. You can contrast this to a type of joke style where the premise is clearly laid out and then the punch happens 
like in a Rodney Dangerfield type of situation. You don't need to know anything about Rodney Dangerfield in order to get the joke. He's going to tell you exactly what you need to know in the premise, and then he's going to give you the punch, and that's all you need to know. Whereas, again, in a style where you're part of the in-group, you get more of this kind of subtle type of humor sometimes. All right. Took the opportunity. If we analyze this, we can say from an incongruity standpoint, the assumption there would be, hey, the Trump trial is a serious and the media is even handed. That's kind of like the outsider's naive view of things. But the alternative story is that the Trump show is a show. It's basically a media show and the media are not actually neutral in their personal opinions. Obviously, the media are quite happy by and large with the the conviction of Trump. So he's basically kind of hitting on what the media, which would be kind of the left, he's going to give them some subtle punches up front, and then he's going to go hard on his opponent later in his monologue. That seems how it builds. Continuing on. To over demonstrate how they took no pleasure (laughs) from this day that they had been dreaming about since childhood. It was. So notice that little bit right there didn't really have a joke format, but his performative style you, you can see as somewhat amusing or entertaining at least. A somber and sad day for America that we have now seen a former president convicted on 34 right. felony counts. I would hope we could all agree that this is a sad moment. The justice system had an honorable day. Our country had a sad day. And Ferris Bueller had the day off. <laughs> So we can basically see that as a joke. He's kind of playing a wordplay joke following again with the word day that seemed to be uh, repeated multiple times. Again, a little bit more subtle in style of humor. So so what's going to be, if we look at it from the incongruity standpoint, we could say that day is being used to emphasize the, the trial impact on people and countries. So we're using this particular day is is having an impact due to, of course, the trial and the outcome. And the alternative story, the breaking of that would be the breaking of the assumption. We are just listing off different people uh, and how they spent the day, right? So this person spending the day worrying about this, this person spending, and Ferris Bueller spent the day off on vacation because he took the day off because of Ferris Bueller's day off. And if you don't know about Ferris Bueller day off, then you're probably not in the in crowd and you're not, you're not cool enough to know what he's talking about here. Perhaps nothing personified the delicate high wire between glee and gravitas more than President Biden's. Now notice he used a little bit of alliteration uh, on that, glee and gravitas. So he's, he's sprinkling a little bit of, of alliteration. I think from a stylistic standpoint, it's, it's really more of his, his performative style uh, means that he's going to use more words than you might use in like a Rodney Dangerfield. Here's the premise. Here's the punch. But those words have a performative style. So they're not like just filler. Cheshire Cat press conference encore. Mr. President, can you tell us, sir, Donald Trump refers to himself as a political prisoner and blames you directly. What's your response? No, no. You can kind of think of that as an analogy right there. Right? He's comparing him to a cat. A Cheshire cat smiling, of course. Don't stop! Don't go! I also want to point out from an AI perspective, in terms of he's using a little bit more of some media, but they're not really using the media in a particularly creative way. It's just a news clip that they're that they're putting in there. There's no like AI art, there's no like movie sayings or clips. He's saying his own movie sayings and he's referencing Ferris Bueller, which again, a lot of people probably don't have any reference to. I do that too all the time, so I'm guilty of that to do that, but we're refer- referencing movies that are pretty out of date. Uh, don't stop! Why can't they tell him? Just Cheap. So, so notice here what he's doing isn't exactly a, a joke. It's a performative style. And notice the whole philosophy, it seems to me, of the joke. It's not a setup in a premise. It's basically saying, look at that guy. That guy is inferior to He's being silly. He's being stupid. You and I wouldn't have done that uh, in this situation. And that's why this uh, is so it's still kind of funny in like a performative you know, style 
rather than a set up in a punch type of style. So it's a sub more subtle thing, it seems to me. <laughs> Whenever he's out in public. And now, I also just want to point out that I think his whole bit is, is more focused on this trial and happens to, to be more like almost like an argumentative format. So in the beginning, he actually throws a couple jabs at what you might think of as his own side, but they're pretty lighthearted jabs. And then he's going to go hard after what you would think is, you know, the other side. So it, I think there's more of a structure to his entire monologue, more like a persuasive argument. And he stops. <laughs> no bueno. <laughs> okay, go. Sir? Do you think the conviction will have an impact on the campaign? We'd love to hear your thoughts, sir. So notice a large part of the joke, there's a lot of wasted time. Like some other comedians would look at this and say, you're not picking up enough laughs per minute or whatever, right? But he really kind of is because it's, it's his acting, the performative stuff that, that pulls a lot of the, the time rather than just here's the premise and here's the punch. Now here from, from if we looked at the, the incongruity theory, we could say, well, what's the assumption here? President Biden is taking the trial seriously and not just as a political win. That's what you would expect kind of from a president. That's the assumption that most people would have. He's kind of breaking that story with the alternative story with his little act here. Biden is politically uh, is politically happy at the verdict, uh, which reveals which he re reveals with the smile, right? So when he's smiling here, he's obviously he's obviously saying, "Yeah, I'm not neutral about this. Obviously, I'm happy about the verdict." And so, on. <laughs> why does everything have to be so f weird? <laughs> so notice again, no real setup or premise here. He's just saying. This guy is silly compared to, to us, right? We wouldn't be so weird in that place. He's f weird. He's funny. Why? And it's kind of funny, right? So you, you, if you have something to say about it, say it. <laughs> if you don't have something to say about it, don't say it. So the whole thing there, why are you being so stupid? No one else would be that stupid. And that's kind of funny, right? We feel superior. But you're just going to stop and hit him with some kind of 70s sitcom freeze frame? <laughs> Mr. President, what do you think of the conviction? So now he actually did a little bit here that is taking into consideration some of the new tools. But again, very light on some of this new stuff. There's no AI animation in it. He's not using actual movie clips or any of that kind of stuff. But he did a little bit. of. Uh, there's a little basic editing that you could do in, in any editing software, which is pretty pretty nicely done here, right, for what it is. Uh, the assumption here, president is serious at his job. Uh, in, in the current moment, the alternative view, the president is acting as serious uh, as is a wacky 70s TV show. So if we think about it in the incongruity premise, what is this really doing? We're saying, hey, look, this is the president. We expect him to be serious about his job and so on and so forth. But in actuality, the seriousness that he has is equivalent to that of basically a 70s TV show. That's why we can think of it or a way we can think of it in terms of the incongruity theory as to why this, why this works is basically a joke. Come on. Why? So for Democrats, of course, the challenge is how do we exploit the moment politically without giving the impression that this was the plan all along. <laughs> Republicans needed to employ a slightly different strategy. This was a sham. So now he's using these clips again, which he's using those pretty effectively. I and mean, he's got that kind of down. We're using the, the, the clips and then we respond to the clips. But we're not really using, again, any like AI clips or or movie clips or, uh, or you know, AI images, which I think could add to, to a lot of presentations. A political show trial from the very beginning. This is the most outrageous travesty I've ever seen. This was not law. This was not criminal justice. This was politics. This was a political smear job. I guess we all need, what, to shop at Banana Republic from now on? Because that's what it feels like. Yeah, a Banana Republic. <laughs> uh, uh, 
after this trial, we need to shop at Old Navy <laughs> because our country is a sinking ship. Now, note here that so obviously we can see that as basically uh, a joke and the idea from an incongruity theory would be the assumption is Banana Republic is a serious charge about why the Trump court case is handled. That's if you first heard that, you would say that's what she's obviously getting at that you know that's like a pun saying that we're acting like a banana republic and obviously he he broke that assumption by saying shopping at banana republic was presented as a as a viable solution to solve the problem is going to be so he's basically saying she's actually thinks that shopping at banana republic is a viable solution and then he comes up with an with a tag onto that with the with the old navy thing it's a sinking ship. We all have to sh we all have to shop at Old Navy. Now, I think it's a, a clever joke just from a construction standpoint, because he's basically saying, you know, because he took that and he did a play on words and you thought I was going Banana Republic this way and I went Banana Republic this way. And then I added the Old Navy as basically a, a tag onto that. And I can see someone like a, a gut filled doing that as well. But I don't think it's the way of the presentation which is kind of interesting also when we analyze it from the philosophy of humor standpoint, because again, I think his other philosophy of humor would be, we're the in crowd, we're the superior people, we're looking down at the other people. He's now from his persuasive argument standpoint, moved from taking the little, the little jabs at his own side to give an, a veneer of balance to hitting hard on the, on the other side. So, and note, instead of having a per, a persuasive argument that basically argues a particular point. It's whenever the other side actually has a point, that's when the joke comes in. And this is why to me, it looks a little bit uh, deceptive, right? So they're making an actual argument. He's constructing his persuasive argument. And every time he comes up to an, an actual point where there's a, where there's a something that he can say constructively about someone else's constructive argument, that's where he uses his humor. And that's why to me, it comes off a little bit more, I feel somewhat deceived by it, even though it was, it was kind of a clever joke. It just seems it's being used in somewhat of a manipulative way. And again, if you agree with him, you might not feel that way as much, but that's, that's, the, that's, what, I'm, that's what I get the, the feeling of in terms of his philosophy of humor is, is gonna be the, the, I, the idea. Gutfield does that as well, but I feel like when he attacked like Joy Reid, for example, he didn't actually misrepresent her opinion in any way that basically anyone would agree with, right? He didn't, he, he basically said, oh, Joy Reid doesn't like, you know, she's, she's doing this because they didn't have the lard covered, chocolate covered lard, you know, <laughs> bowls or whatever at Costco. I think that exaggeration was so exaggerated that no one actually believes it, right? So he's not actually trying to misrepresent other people's opinion. So again, I might be overreading that because of my own kind of biases, but that's how I'm reading it. It was, a, it was a sham, a sham, this trial, a sham, I say. It was a sham. I'm so see here, here again. So again, note that this kind of ad hominem thing, the personal attacks happen on both sides, but you can kind of see that the John Stewart framing of it is clearly from the idea of we're the superior smart people and these are just jabbering chatterboxes you shouldn't be listening to. And, and he has this little mocking, you know, kind of thing that he does there as well. It was a sham. I'm shopping at Old Navy. <laughs> the trial was a sham. Yes, we impaneled grand juries and submitted evidence and cross-examined witnesses. But how is Donald Trump or his family not allowed on the jury? Outrageous! <laughs> so now note that you can kind of see that as a joke because there's some type of incongruity there, but clearly he's making his persuasive argument as well. So this comes back to the question of, is he using the situation to basically uh, make jokes or is he using uh, his skill with joke and rhetoric to help him with a persuasive argument? And if he is doing a persuasive argument, I think we then have to question, is it a fair pers persuasive argument? Are we being manipulated or do we have a legitimate persuasive argument that we should be, uh, that we should be engaging with or some questions that kind of come up to me? So in this case, 
the claim the trial was biased is is a valid concern. That's what you would get by listening to these people, right? You listen to those people and you say, hey, that sounds like they're serious people. They might have valid concerns. Well, from if you look at this from a persuasive argument, as if John Stewart's kind of a lawyer, he's basically discredited these people, of course, and now he's stealing up the tri- the court system by by basically saying, hey, look, the court system has the trappings of a legitimate court system. There was a jury, there was a judge and whatnot, and so on and so forth. And if it talks like a duck and walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, it's got to be a duck. But obviously, again, you probably have courts that have the trappings of a banana repu- in a banana republic as well, right? So I don't see that as a really valid kind of argument. So then the question is, well, was it an argument or was it just kind of a joke? From a joke standpoint, you could say, well, the assumption that it was a trial and they broke the story, these people would not be happy unless the trial was rigged in their favor. That's going to be breaking the assumption, basically. If you looked at it from the concept of a fallacy, you could say it might be caused for casual oversimplification, which, again, could be fine in comedy if it's there for a joke, right? But And then you could think of it as kind of like a straw man as well, which is the trial had the trappings of a legitimate legal system, therefore it was one. So in other words, because it had these kind of couple things that resemble a legitimate trial, it therefore was a legitimate trial, right? That's a little oversimplified from from that standpoint. The the Republican don't, don't want an honest trial, but rather to have Trump's family on the jury. So these people are arguing that they want to have an honest trial and so on and so forth. But that's not really the story here. They want a whole to have the jury stacked with Trump's actual family, which, again, is an exaggeration from a joke standpoint. But you can see that it has a pretty strong, seems to me, political angle uh, as well. I guess in America now we need to start shopping at bonobos because our country is getting f***ed at both ends. So I won't go into his bonobo joke. Uh, he, he throws in some crude jokes. And crude jokes, I think, just work a lot of times simply because they're crude sometimes. But, you know, they, there could be interesting stuff within a crude joke as well when it's clever. But also just having the crudeness for crudeness sometimes just is the shock value of of it as well justice system wasn't a sham but certainly applying our justice system to donald trump was this is the weaponization of the justice system against their political opponent this is a justice system that hunts republicans while protecting democrats oh my god the justice system hunts republicans while protecting democrats someone should mention that to such unprotected democrats as senator robert menendez and congressman henry cuellar both Now, you can kind of see this as a joke because you're looking at the guy and you're saying this guy's making an allocation that the justice system is being weaponized uh, and and that's and he looks like a serious person and so on and so forth. So that would be the assumption that we make. He's shattering that assumption by saying that this is a person that doesn't know what he's talking about because he doesn't know about these these other things that he's saying are basically related and and therefore uh, he's not worth, you know, listening to, right? So basically from, from a fallacious, so you can see that as a joke, there's a joke construction to it, which is strongly associated to like a fallacious argument thing as well, because that's what a joke is with the incongruity. So you can also think of it from a fallacy standpoint as a red herring and possibly an ad hominem, because the argument is that the legal system is attacking Trump in a political way. That's the argument that the person's going to be making. If you take him seriously, then you'd say, okay, that's I'm going to assume that's a valid argument. But the reply, but what about these other unrelated uh, cases? So he's he's basically trying to say, we're talking about this particular case, right? And he's saying, no, what about these other cases that are that are unrelated? And so he's kind of taking the focus onto another kind of topic. And which is a, which is something that the left claims that the right does all the time, you know, as well. What what aboutism is a common phrase that they're going to that they're going to use. And, and then, of course, the indication is that this guy doesn't have any authority. He doesn't know about this other stuff. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So if you look at this and think of him as a persuasive arguer or as basically kind of a lawyer, 
you can think of him as this would be kind of like he's invalidating his his uh, the the people that are arguing against him, right? The witnesses, if you want to think about it that way, that that he's he's basically discrediting their standpoint, saying that they don't have a valid opinion because they're not taking into consideration these things, and therefore we should throw out you know their testimony. If you were to think about this from an argumentative, political, persuasive standpoint. And again, to my mind, it seems that he's making a persuasive argument. And every time he runs into part of that persuasive argument where there's some resistance, where he'd have to actually make a, a persuasive point against a valid point, that's when the joke comes in, right? To, 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 to misdirect at that point so that he doesn't have to do the work at the time when an actual argument comes up. That's why to me, it, he feels a lot more like it's a persuasive argument and it doesn't seem, I feel manipulated, right? Even if this was on the other side, I think I would feel manipulated, m manipulated a little bit more than gut filled. In facing my corruption charges brought by our Department of Justice. Not to mention Hunter Biden was facing jury selection in a federal gun charges trial today. <laughs> Probably why you noticed everyone on Fox and Friends this morning using pillows to cover their boners. It was. So again, so now we put another one that in there. It's a little bit crude. So he likes to throw in that crude stuff from time to time. Sometimes it has a clever component to it, but sometimes you just get that shock value of something just crude in there. But you can look at that from uh, from an incongruity. You can say, well, the assumption is that Fox News is a serious news program covering the story in an objective way like news programs would. That would be the common assumption if you're not in the know, if you're not one of the cool people. But the alternative story he's saying here with the punch is basically Fox is sexually excited over the Hunter Biden gun case. That's how fired up and how partisan they are. They're actually sexually excited over it. So they so that then they had to have this funny image that you would have in your mind, which he actually did throw up on here using some of the AI topics or some of you know, video clips a little bit more effectively. And and so you could see the visual image of that as well, which you can't typically do in like a stand up situation. But now you've done it, liberals, through your sham weaponization, the good hearted and good intentioned denizens of Magatania <laughs> have finally been pushed too far. Be ready, because on January 20 of next year, when he's former President Joe Biden, so you can see his his standard routine is to take the actual video clip and then do something against the video clip. So he's using that amount of media a little more now, effectively good for the goose possibly. is good for the gander. The Daily Wire's Matt Walsh said Trump should, quote, make and publish a list of 10 high-ranking Democrat criminals who he will have arrested when he takes office. These Democrats will rue the day they decided to use lawfare to stop a presidential candidate. It won't be Hunter Biden the next time. It's going to be Joe Biden. It could potentially still be Barack Obama. It could still- So notice he's using a fairly long clips in the middle of his, in the middle of his monologue, which is probably, again, not something that Gutfield often does as much. Gutfield really going, I think, more for the comedy of it, which has a setup and a punch, more a little bit closer to Dangerfield, right? Set up punch. The reason he had, the reason Gutfield has a clip on there is usually to set up as quick as possible for the punch, not usually so much to make the political Potentially point, be Hillary at Clinton. least in his comedy show. Right? It could be Barack Obama. <laughs> now notice there, again, no actual joke really there. It's more in his body language, basically. And it, obviously we're going from the philosophical standpoint of we're in the know, we're superior, these people over here, they're the butt of the joke, they're down below. That's why it's funny, right? We're making fun of them. First of all, why is she broadcasting in front of Georgia O'Keeffe's vagina? Okay, so here we go again with, again, I th these jokes are, are somewhat crude again, and I don't have anything personally just against crudeness in general as a comedian, but obviously the crudeness is being used I don't think very, eh, it's kind of funny, I don't know, but but you can also get a shock value from that. Now, if we look at this from a analysis standpoint, the assumption that's being broken, these are serious people making legitimate arguments about the situation 
uh, and, and consequences. So if you took these people seriously, that's the assumption you would get if you watch those clips seriously. That, but if that's if you're not in the know, you don't know what's going on, man. If you're in the know, though, the alternative story is Barack Obama, Barack Obama is infallible, untouchable, and omnipotent. And saying otherwise means uh, that, that you're crazy. You're a crazy person. That's basically, <laughs> I think that's, his, that's the argument from the inside person. So everybody that doesn't think that is stupid and therefore she's stupid. I think that's basically it. So only a silly person would think otherwise is kind of, you know, it's kind of the argument, right? So you, and you know that he's going to say that before because you're one of the cool people. You're in the know. I think that's the kind of the vibe personally. And that's, and you're getting more of the humor from being on the inside, which again, I think everybody have. Greg Gudfield does that to some degree, but I think someone like a Rodney Dangerfield doesn't do that so much because it's the humor is more directed at him. It's more of a uh, anybody can participate type of thing. It's not an inside outside game. Now, if we look at the fallacies area here, the way we had the overgeneralization and ad hominem when uh, when he and his family put pillows on their lap. Uh, it is because they have an, an, an erection. So we could say the whole thing with the Fox News putting the pillows on their lap because they were overly excited about the Hunter Biden uh, gun case. You might call that an overgeneralization or an ad hominem. Obviously, it's attack an attack on them because they're, they're stupid people with pillows on their laps, probably because they're sexually excited. Uh, or you could, you could think of it as an overgeneralization because he's thinking of something that is common to him, possibly, possibly, for example, whenever his family puts pillows on their laps, it's because they have an erection. So he applies that to everyone, right? <laughs> that might be, you know, so you, you might see it in, in that an overgeneralization from a comedic standpoint, right? He's saying this could apply in one case, and therefore I, pl I applied it to here where it probably doesn't, you know, apply. Now with the backdrop situation, you might think of that as a red herring and once again, an ad hominem. It's clearly an, an, an attack as well. She is a, she's talking about the Trump trial, uh, but, but what about her background, right? So in other words, he's basically changing the topic. And again, I think this is something that seems to me it's somewhat deceptive in his argument because he has a persuasive argument. He's stealing up the legitimacy of the court and he's putting these other people on the screen but every time they come up with a point, that's when the joke comes in. He says, I'm going to swerve around this point by using my humor at that particular time, which serves two purposes. It makes that person look stupid and and it avoids having to make the argument in where I would make an argument for my persuasive argument, because that's where I put the joke. Right? So and then it also says this person does not what know what she's talking about and has an absurd background, right? So, so now we've kind of changed the topic at that, at that point of, in time. And second, perhaps it is time for those on the right to begin to examine what it might be like to investigate Hillary and William Clinton or perhaps to do it continuously and relentlessly for the last 30 years. But OK, so again, you can kind of see that as a joke because he's setting up a premise that you should do this. And then he broke the premise. But obviously, he's also making a, a point as well. So if we think about it from a joke structure format, we could say, well, the claim that Trump is being treated unfairly is a valid political concern. That's that's his setup. Right. And if you think about how is that premise broken, he says, actually, the Republicans had done far worse to their political opponents in the past. So so again, you can think of that as a setup and a punch. However, the the, the setup and the punch are basically like I said this and you did that, too. Well, you did it first. It sounds more like it doesn't sound like an exaggerated fallacy situation that's done for com comedic humor. It sounds to me like we're in the part of the monologue where he's really going after more of a political persuasive uh, point. So we could call that uh, from a fallacy standpoint, false equivocation, e equivalence, false equivalence, because and again, the left argues that the right does this all all the time. What about ism? Right. So the, so they're saying, hey, look, this court case is not being validly done 
there's there's shortcuts being taken. And he's saying, well, what about uh, the Clinton case, obviously? Now, again, if there was a valid comparison, you can argue that there's a valid comparison and so on and so forth. But he's basically, again, going after something else, which you could say is like a, a red herring false equivalence, for for example, from from the, uh, a fallacy standpoint. And again, you can argue, well, whether or not it's a valid fallacy or or is it, you know, is it funny or is it an argument? To admit their own political gamesmanship, their own attempts at weaponizing justice, their own relentless pursuit of opponents, their own dehumanizing rhetoric towards the left would be to allow a molecule of reality into the airtight distortion field that has been created to... So that whole thing sounded to me, again, like a persuasive argument. And he's, and he, and he's used some kind of rhetorical tool, rhetorical question and hyperbole or equivocation. So how was Trump's family not led on the jury? So I'm going way back to the, to the Trump's family thing. He asked a rhetorical question when he proposed that. Well, there's, you, have, you, have these, there's, you have a court case, you have this and that, legal trappings. But then he puts in something absurd, but he does it in the format of a rhetorical question. How is it that his family wasn't on the jury, though, right? So that was a pretty you know, clever way of structuring it. Trump's family on the jury would be an exaggeration. So obviously, you know, you can also think of in terms of rhetorical techniques, putting Trump on the jury is clearly an exaggeration. So you're saying, well, the thing's not fair uh, what, you know, how would it be fair? We, we, would we need Trump's family on the actual jury? Would that be fair? Because they're arguing that they're in the wrong jurisdiction and stuff and that you put them in a place where everybody hates them and they can, right? So, but, and then rhetorical question and personification. Uh, why is she? So he asked, I think, a, a rhetorical question. And then background is, is kind of personal or, or maybe it is a false comparison. In other words, when he was talking about uh, the background, he asked once again a rhetorical question. Why is she in front of this background that looks like a blah, blah, blah? And so that's kind of a rhetorical question because he doesn't expect an answer from it. And then he says the background, you can kind of think, it, think of it as personification in some way because he's putting human characteristics on a background that doesn't have any human characteristics, right? He's saying it is like human characteristics, right? So he's kind of personifying her background screen. And then when he made this little argument right here, he used uh, anaphora because he repeated over and over, they don't see their own. They don't see their own malpractice. They don't see their own problems. They don't see their own hypocrisy. So that's kind of like the Martin Luther King speech where he's like, I have a dream. I have a dream. He's hammering, he's hammering, his point home and what it looks like a persuasive argument. He kind of used like the rule of three there as well, because he said that three times. He might have said it four, but three would be the, the most emphasis, which often works with joke structure, but is also very impactful from a rhetorical standpoint. Protect Magadonians from the harsh glare of actuality. <laughs> it is a place where a moment such as this next one can pass without so much as a gasp of, what planet do you live on? <laughs> For it is clearly not ours. He famously said regarding Hillary so Clinton, skip lock her up. Some you of this. Apologize. You did not say the words lock, so now, lock up Hillary. Now oh. he's, he's, now he, like if you look at this from a legal standpoint, he's kind of discrediting the person that would be on stage, which would be, which would be on trial, which is Trump by basically saying, you said you didn't say this, and now we're saying that you did say this again. So he's putting that person down, which is funny, but it's also from a rhetorical argument standpoint, uh, you, you could say, well, he's, doing, he's acting kind of like a lawyer, right? Basically making the argument and then discrediting Whatever them. flaws the American justice system has, and they are legion, especially for non-billionaire former presidents, it does appear to be the last place in America where you can't just say whatever the f you want, regardless of reality. Trump knows. So now, of course, he's steal he's stealing up the legal system, basically saying the legal system works and implying, of course, that it worked properly in the case of Trump. Right. So he's seems to me he's 
Now he's laying down his final punchline in what seems to be more of a, pol- a persuasive argument. Oh, is this better than anyone? Now, I would have testified. I wanted to testify. The theory is you never testify because as soon as you testify, anybody, if it were George Washington, don't testify because they'll get you on something that you said slightly wrong and then they sue you for perjury. You would have said something out of whack, like it was a beautiful sunny day and it was actually raining out. Yes, our jails in America are filled with incompetent weathermen. So once again, it, so this serves, so you can see that from a joke standpoint in terms of incongruity, Trump is saying a valid thing about the way the legal system works. That would be the assumption if you took this seriously. Obviously at this point in time, we know that he's gonna ridicule whoever's on this little screen he puts up here, right? So what's the alternative story? The analogy should be taken literally about people going to jail for being, being wrong about the weather. So, I, so it's a case of misdirection, which is clever from a joke standpoint, you said something about the weather and people going to jail because they had the wrong weather forecast. And then he kept going with that story saying, well, that's why the jails are full of, of weather uh, people, which, which obviously wasn't the, and, so, and by doing that as well, he's basically saying that, you know, he's stupid for making a silly assumption. You know, he doesn't say it in a playful way as though, look what I did, which was tricky with words. He says it as though what the guy on the screen said was stupid. Right? He's stupid for saying that analogy, not just that I'm clever because I did some little wordplay thing over here, right? That's going to be, and you could tell that by, again, it's per, the, by the way he acts with it. So, I, so again, you can ha- have, there was an, an ad homican, Re- Republicans don't live in reality. That was back in 825, one of the prior ones from a rhetorical device. And then attacking a straw man, Republicans are not just complaining about the misjustice related to the Trump trial. They want uh, to tear down the entire legal system is basically the, the idea that they're, that they're making. In other words, the, you, if you listen to the people making the case here, including Trump in this case, the idea would be, hey, look, the legal system is not working in this case because you have a presidential candidate, which means that there's no way that you cannot have it be political, politicized. And he's using a straw man argument to say that what they actually mean is that the Republicans want to tear down the entire legal system. That's what they actually are claiming. So he's basically, it's kind of a straw man argument. This is what they're actually arguing, which is a much larger thing than what they're actually arguing is the, is the idea. This is why the law and order right hates court procedures when applied to them. Courts are the last remaining guardrail that has a standard of evidentiary presentation. It is the last place where you have to prove what you say and you see the difference in what they say out of court versus what they say in court. Okay, so I'm gonna stop it basically here, but you can see he's ending what it seems to me is more of a persuasive argument, stealing up the court system and saying that this case is in alignment with a properly functioning court system, right? And so, and that's, and so, uh, the assumption there was a problem in the legal system as it was applied to Trump case due to t- political influence. That's the case that they're, that the Republicans are making, which keeps showing on the screen. The alternative story, the legal system worked just as it should. Trump justice, Trump got justice just like anybody else would in, uh, in their place from the legal system. Uh, and that's, that's kind of like his argument. Again, that's a pretty weak joke that looks kind of like he's ending off on his political argument. And then he's going to continue on here. Basically, the rest of it is basically trying to, sh- trying to show the, the incongruity of what people say in court and out of court. And again, I would think that's part of the argument of a persuasive argument. Uh, not exactly funny, right? It's, it's designed to, to take down or discredit, you can think of it as almost a legal or persuasive argument. So if we look at this, then let's just scroll down here. I know his was a little bit longer because I think, again, he had an argumentative structure. Presentation style, I think he's much more animated in his presentation style. So he depends much more on his acting skills, much more because he's got to be, he's like the in person. He's the, the cool person that's leading the in crowd versus the out crowd. 
Uh, so, and that depends a lot on his style and his ability to, to, to kind of, seems to me, put the other people that he puts on screen kind of down. So much more of the dialogue is dependent on body language, uh, seems to have generally, a generally feel of annoyance consistent with uh, uh, himself and his audience as superior. So I think f that lines up with his philosophy of humor, which, which is basically he has a style of saying half of his joke is, again, I think putting him and his audience up and laughing at the other person as opposed to the reverse, laughing at himself or relying just on like what I think Gutfield style is, which is more of like a putting yourself in like a playground thing and just and, and having it more of a, a fun situation. You're not really laughing down so much. But again, you might disagree with that because I know there's there's an aspect of judgment with that as well. But I think you can look at that somewhat objectively and come to that conclusion as well, even if I saw in any case. Uh, and, and then in here, is the political situation used to make a joke or is the joke designed to make a political point or both? Now, to me, I would say I feel like 90 percent of what we had here is a pretty structured, persuasive argument using jokes as a tool to help in the persuasion, which I'm not against, really. But I am against when it becomes deceptive in the usage of the tool. And I do feel that it's a little bit deceptive, in my opinion. Again, I don't agree with them, so I'm, I'm a little biased against it. But it seems deceptive in use. Why do I say that? Well, he's st he has a longer monologue. It looks very structured, right? He starts off with a few jabs to his own side. I think that looks like it's an appeal to look like there's balance. And then he abandons that completely and goes where he really wants to go, which is to attack the rivals almost as a lawyer would, right? And so his jokes are kind of funny at first, but then it seems like the jokes get more and more to be less ha-ha funny jokes and more like they're serving a purpose to disparage the, the political arguments of his opponents, if you think of it as like a court case and him as a lawyer, he's discrediting his you know opponents basically through most of the of, of the jokes. And then and then he's also basically stealing up the court system by basically mocking the people that are that are mock, that are that are saying there's a problem with the court system. And then he's basically saying the court system is doing quite well. And then he basically ends his his monologue by saying uh, by saying, you know, Trump got what he deserves, basically, is the is this and anyone else in his situation would have been treated exactly the same th way because we have a fair legal system. That's and it seems to me every time there was a actual point in the argument that he would have to argue against a valid point to say, hey, wait. It, it's Trump as president. Isn't that a little bit different? Don't we have political situations different than any other person? And the legal system might have strains in that case. Anytime those valid points might come up, that's when he uses the humor to misdirect, which means to me that feels deceptive. Uh, and, and it doesn't feel like I'm in an honest dialogue or in, a, in an honest kind of funny situation. That's how, that's how it comes off. Uh, to me, I'm trying to look at it somewhat as objectively as I can, but again, I'm somewhat biased on it, but that's my interpretation of it.